All right, well, we are, as you know, at the end of the series of conflict stories. We've indicated that each of the stories seems to highlight a way in which corrupt religious authority tends to abuse its power. We've looked at these. The last of them has to do with the idea that religious authority loves to be served. Jesus said once to his disciples, you know the way of the Gentiles. They love to lord it over people. They like to be in the position of being served. It will not be that way among you. He that will be great among you, let him become the servant. And of course, Jesus himself says, the Son of Man didn't come to, to uh, be served, but to serve. In a sense, that's hiding behind the scenes in this text. And our hint is that this man with a withered hand, apparently, well, he wasn't born that way. Apparently, this was some sort of injury or disease, at least the word that's used implies that. Luke says that it was his right hand. Mark doesn't mention that, but it's certainly implied here. This is the hand we normally associate with work, with labor, with service, with production, and it's, his hand is unable to labor. So in a sense, what's happening in this story, beside, behind just this healing moment, is a man is being restored to his capacity to serve, you see. And it's happening at the very best place it could happen, in the synagogue, in the church, as it were, on the Sabbath. He's being restored to life and health. But these who are trying to impair that are accusing Jesus at this point of violating the Sabbath. So it's an interesting set of issues here. Mark begins by saying he entered the synagogue again and a man was there who had a withered hand. Entering the synagogue again suggests, of course, that he's still in Capernaum. This is where he's been for this entire series of stories. All of these things have happened in that vicinity. Last week he was in a, in a grain field, you recall. The week before that he was calling Levi from a tax office in Capernaum. Before that he was in Peter's house and the paralytic was let down through the roof. All of these things happening apparently there. He's in the synagogue and this is apparently the subsequent Sabbath. So last week's story took place on the Sabbath. Jesus was in a grain field with his disciples, picking some grain, some wheat, gleaning, permissible under Jewish law, but some said not on the Sabbath. So now that incident, which was probably provoked when Jesus concluded by saying to them, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath, which must have hit them like a little nuclear explosion, you know. That set in motion the series of events that leads us to this story, and everything in this story suggests it's a setup. This is not happening incidentally or accidentally, but it is by design that we reach this moment in which the Pharisees are now hoping to catch Jesus in some sort of overt definitive crime. So it's the second Sabbath controversy. It's the last of the conflict stories. It's the most intense of them. So far, Jesus has been styled as a blasphemer because he forgave sins. That was the first of them. Then a colleague of sinners because he called Levi, an associate of publicans and sinners. The next one, one who disregards religious discipline because he doesn't call his disciples to fast as did the disciples of the Pharisees, the disciples of John the Baptist. And finally, last week, a violator of Sabbath rules. But the problem last week for the religious critics was that there was, even among themselves, some little difference of opinion as to whether or not what Jesus was doing was really technically permissible. So really now, they want to catch him red-handed, you know, hand in the cookie jar. They want some crime for which there can be no debate so that Jesus can be characterized now as an outright criminal, a violator of the Sabbath laws. And so in a sense, this moment seems to be all orchestrated by them to accomplish that purpose. The guy that they put there in the synagogue, probably chosen for this very purpose, is a man with a withered hand. 
as it's described. The Greek that Mark uses here literally means a dried up hand. It's not a medical term, but then Mark isn't a physician. It's used actually quite a few times in the New Testament. It's a fairly common word. In Mark, it's applied, for example, to a planting that dried up. The woman who had the issue of blood was healed. That is, the flow of blood dried up when she touched the hem of Jesus' garment. The fig tree that was cursed by Jesus dried up from the roots. So that word shows up, and throughout the New Testament, we find it relatively frequently in that sense. The use of the word, however, the particular uh, design of the word implies that this was not congenital. The man apparently was not born with this, but somehow or other some injury or disease had rendered his hand, as Mark says, dried up. Luke, the physician, who often uses Greek language that is sort of technical in character, the kind of thing an MD might use these days, you know, describing things in language the rest of us don't understand. Well, sometimes that's what Luke does, and he uses a much more precise word to describe it, but it really amounts to the same thing, and you can imagine what the condition was. As I mentioned earlier, Luke also tells us it was the man's right hand, and that again seems to at least telegraph to us subtly this was the means of his employment. This was the means of his ability to be a productive individual. There's a strong tradition in church history that suggests that very thing. An apocryphal gospel, heavily used by the Ebionites, who were a highly Jewish form, a sect really, of the Christian faith, active in the early part of the second century, having their roots back in sometimes what are called the Judaizers in the New Testament. They had a gospel they liked a lot, and it gives an account of this same story, but includes what is at least purportedly the request made by the man with the withered hand in the following words, quote, I was a mason seeking my living by manual labor. I beseech thee, Jesus, to restore me the use of my hand that I may not be compelled to beg bread, you see. Now, whether the man said anything like that is wide open. I rather doubt it. Uh, this is a very embellished gospel, but it does stand for this idea that there was at least broadly an understanding that this story uh, involves a man who had been prevented from continuing his labors because of some kind of injury or mishap that had taken place. And if that's the case, it does help us understand something of what's going on here. All right, so they, the Pharisees, watched him closely whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. They watched him closely. Mark puts this in the imperfect tense, so to be a little more faithful to the sense of it, we would say they kept on watching him, watching him like a, claw, uh, like a, a hawk, you know, uh, keeping their eyes peeled for any possible basis upon which they could accuse him of criminal behavior. Here's your Greek lesson. You should be able to read this by now. Anyone want to take a shot at this? How would you say that word? Para, remember the, the letter that looks like an R, uh, I'm sorry, it looks like a P is actually an R. So it's para te reo, para te reo. Isn't that a lovely word? I think Greek is just a beautiful language, you know, it's really nice. The, uh, the, it's a combination of a couple of words. The latter part of it, tereo, means to look at something, to examine it, and even to examine it closely. The force of the word is ramped up considerably by the prefix para. We have many words in English that use para as a prefix. Here, para tereo, therefore, means to examine with meticulous uh, detail, you see, to just be watching in every conceivable angle what's happening. So that's the picture. Here's Jesus in the synagogue, probably teaching, you know, and you've got this little bank of critics, and you can see their notebooks, and they're just kind of watching him. There's not much positive affirmation on their faces. They're just, doing, they're just looking for anything he may do. As I was thinking about this word, it reminded me 
of my career as a lawyer. You know, when I was a kid, my favorite show, you want to guess what it was? Perry Mason. That's where it all got started, you know? And I just loved it when Perry Mason, he never was embarrassed in court. You notice that? He never was embarrassed. I thought, what a, what a job, you know, to just always have the right answers. And, and just at the critical moment, somebody stands up out in the gallery and says, I did it, I did it, I killed him, you know? And it's just wonderful. You think, wow, what an adventure to do that. And I think I actually had Perry Mason somewhere in my subliminal consciousness when I enrolled for law school years ago, hoping that someday I could be, you know, it doesn't work out that way. Any of you that uh, have been there, you know that uh, it never happens in the Perry Mason style. And one of the things that was a little bit disturbing to me as I started doing trial work, and I did a fair amount over the years, was it is always a little disturbing to be in court and know that there is somebody, I was always convinced there was somebody in that courtroom smarter than I am, he knows more than I do, He's better at this job than I am, and he's watching me like a hawk. We call that critter opposing counsel. And somehow or other, I just knew everything I was saying was under the scrutiny, and I was just waiting, dreading, objection, Your Honor, you know. It does have a chilling effect on a person's creative energies to have somebody there who is critically examining every move you make. Here are experts in the Jewish law critically examining Jesus. And the entire situation does feel a little bit like a trial. And Jesus is the defendant. And the prosecutors are just waiting for an opportunity to seize on some misstep. And so here we are. The irony of the story is that before it's over, Jesus the defendant becomes Jesus the prosecutor. And he asks the questions, the cross-examination that rips off the mask of these who are trying to catch him. So it's a reversal that takes place in this short story in a fairly, I think, dramatic way. Well. Jesus is being examined. One commentator, I think, astutely noted that Jesus is always being examined. There has not been a generation in the history of the human race that has not examined and re-examined Jesus, looking for some flaw. The interesting thing is, there's, there's been nobody in the, human, in the history of humanity, I think you can safely say this, who has not been more meticulously examined than Jesus of Nazareth and at the same time, there's no human being more universally admired than Jesus of Nazareth. Even people who don't own the name Christian, nevertheless, will many times readily acknowledge that he's the greatest man that ever lived. In fact, so much so that it almost surprises us when someone doesn't take that view. George Bernard Shaw once noted, well, Jesus sometimes didn't behave like a Christian, you know which someone said, that's interesting, the only standard to which George Bernard Shaw could hold Jesus was Jesus. That's the only, you know, the best standard he had to work with there. But it is true. It's also the case, this commentator added, that Jesus is not only criticized in terms of his own life and reputation, but he is criticized as people examine his people, us. Jesus is critically reviewed based on what we do. We are, in some people's experience, Christ. And we're always disturbed, I think, you'll agree with me, when we find plastered on the newspaper some scandal, some unfortunate, unhappy incident, because somebody who was identified with Christ, a Christian minister, a Christian leader, has all of a sudden been caught in some misdeed. At the same time, we are filled with joy when we see just the opposite. I know all of you have been impressed with the stories in the press these last few days about the church in Coeur d'Alene, uh, the altar and its pastor who was shot in the back. And as the stories began to unfold of this remarkable pastor who it looks like is going to recover, what a wonderful testimony reaching to people, just like this tragically 
demented person who shot him, reaching that kind of person and bringing them to Christ. That's what we like to hear, and that's what we need to be. This examination of Christ is going to continue until the end of time, and we just happen to have the opportunity at this moment in history to be the ones, in a sense, on trial. So this sense of living in that sort of fishbowl and being examined by the world around us is something we certainly must take to heart. Well, what were they looking for? They were looking for Jesus to do work, that's all. They were probably provoked by Jesus' comment last week, the Son of Man, clearly himself, is the Lord of the Sabbath. And the people who first heard Jesus said that, say that would have taken that as tantamount to a claim to deity because it, you could hardly imagine how the statement could be made without that being the case. And so they are reeling at such an audacious, arrogant claim. They can't, through the eyes of faith, see the truth of it, but instead they want to somehow prove its, dis, uh, its untruth, and this is their opportunity to do it. As I say, the whole scene does have a, a feel of a setup, you know, so they probably solicited the services of this unfortunate man with the withered hand. They probably put him on the front row, right there where he's plainly visible to everybody, including Jesus. And they're sitting over there, critically examining, hoping now that he's going to take the bait. You know, will Jesus fall into the trap so that they can accuse him? Is he going to heal on the Sabbath? Now, the, the difference between this situation and the one last week is that on this point there was no debate. Last week it was debatable whether what Jesus was doing with his disciples in the grain field was a violation of the Sabbath. You had good people on both sides. Most would say it was a violation, but not everyone. At this point there's unanimity. Nobody disagrees on this. The Jerusalem Talmud actually specifically listed the forms of healing, the maladies that could be treated lawfully on the Sabbath and invariably, it was only life-threatening situations. You couldn't even set a broken bone on the Sabbath because that could wait till the next day, you see. Anything that could wait had to wait until the Sabbath had passed. Well, this man had a withered hand. There was certainly nothing life-threatening about it. There was nothing that would prevent everyone from waiting till the next day. But now here they are, in a sense, hoping Jesus will uh, take this opportunity to violate the laws with respect to the Sabbath. They did this so that they might accuse him. The Greek word for accuse is categorize. It's really the same word as our English word categorize. They want to put him in a category. And the category they want to put him into is, is criminal. They want to be able to label him as a violator of the law and thus dispatch him. So what happens? Well, we're sitting here and Jesus now simply says to the man, step forward. It's interesting that he says this to the man. Now, the apocryphal gospel I read earlier suggests the man made the request, but you notice Luke doesn't, or Mark doesn't say that, Luke doesn't say it, Matthew doesn't say it, none of the accounts of this say that. The entire story proceeds, I think, more faithfully to what happened that he's just sitting there. This is one of the very, very rare occasions when Jesus solicits a patient, you know? Usually people come and ask for help. The leper came to Jesus and said, if you're willing, you can make me clean. The uh, blind Barnabas on the, on the way to, uh, to Jerusalem says, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus brings him over. What do you want? He's a blind man, but Jesus still asks, what do you want? Lord, that I may receive my sight. Even the woman with the flow of blood comes to Jesus, hoping to stay under the radar. She reaches out, just touches the hem of his garment. She doesn't want to be discovered, but she still comes to him. Here's maybe the only example of someone who is just sitting there, making no request, and Jesus calls that person, you, come forward. And immediately the tone of this situation seems to change as Jesus now exercises that kind of control. What he says to the man 
much more faithfully to the, the Greek here would be stand up and stand in the middle or stand in the midst. It's translated step forward, but that doesn't really quite get it. It's two verbs, stand up or get up really and stand in the midst. See. Jesus wants this man center stage. He wants all the attention in the room focused on him. Notice again how unusual that is. Usually when Jesus heals, he'll take the person off to the side. He'll say, don't tell anybody about this. Don't make a big deal about this. He wants to keep it more or less uh, quiet. You see, he's not a man for spectacle. He's not trying to put on a show. This isn't a circus. And yet now, on one of those very, very rare occasions, Jesus actually makes this man stand right in the middle. Usually we politely ignore people, you know, who are impaired in some way, but not Jesus. He pulls him right out there, and every eye in the room is fixed on that man. And the drama in the room must have been so thick that you could feel it in the air. The man is simply standing there. And then Jesus looks at his bank of accusers, those Pharisees with their notebooks, and now all of a sudden, they're not looking at Jesus, Jesus is looking at them. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? To save a life or to kill? I don't know about you, the first time you read that question, it seems a little odd, doesn't it? It seems an odd question. There is in logic something called a false dilemma where you set up a proposition and you restrict artificially the answers to yes or no when there may be a third alternative. And it almost seems like Jesus is doing that here. What do you mean? Is it lawful on the Sabbath to give life or to take life? Let me think about that. You know, it's like there's a, a, almost an artificial kind of um, imposition here, and we might wonder about this question, but actually hiding behind it is this powerful unmasking of these accusers. It is a cross-examining question. It is a leading question. And Jesus has just now put himself in the position of the prosecutor toward these who had been trying to prosecute him. He starts the question, is it lawful? Last week we were talking about what's lawful. Why do your disciples do that which is not lawful? They're picking the grain, they're eating it, and so on. Jesus now poses the question, what is lawful? What's lawful? Last week's story left at least a little bit of ambiguity in the air. Is this lawful or not? This week, the ambiguity is going to be reduced to a stark contrast. Is it lawful to do this or do that? The black, the white, the, the bright lines separating the two. The whole question of what is lawful does tend to preoccupy our minds with things like limits, boundaries, prohibition. When I was uh, first out of college, I bluffed my way into a teaching position in a little Bible school. Some of you know this story, and I was there for about eight years, you know, teaching students who were usually fresh out of high school. So some of them went to this school for a year or two before going on to college. So these are college-age students, and you know in the culture of typical healthy college-age students, uh, there can be romance in the air. You know what I'm saying? And so we had a few budding romances in the student population, two or three hundred students there. And of course you know that a budding romance can give rise to certain temptations. And on more than one occasion I had a young, usually it was a young man, come to me in private and say, can I ask you a question? Well, sure, yeah, I was expecting some great question in theology, you know. You explained, you know, superlapsarianism or something like that. And, and uh, yeah, the question would come. Well, you know that I'm in this relationship with, you know, such and so, young lady. And I'm just wondering, can you help me understand, where should we draw the line? Now, if you don't understand that question, go ask your mother, you know. <laughs> but <clears throat> you know what's going on there. There's the natural energies, 
associated with love and romance and so on and a little bit of affection and, and you know, to his credit, here's a fellow that comes and says, I just want to know, how far can we go? I remember once responding to that, you mean, what you're really asking me is, how close to sin can we get and still be safe? How close to wickedness can we, you know, and still be on the safe side of this? We want to get just as close as we can, but we don't want to cross the line because the legalistic mindset is concerned about lines and about what is lawful. And usually the fixation is just getting barely to that boundary, but not going too far, you see. And that notion of line drawing, of setting limits, setting boundaries, is one of the preoccupations that is highly destructive in the life of faith. Because it gets us fixated on all the wrong things. And in a sense, that was the whole design of the Pharisees. They lived their lives day in and day out in a meticulous, rather scientific quest to draw lines and say, it's right here. No, no, it's right over there. Well, I think it's right here. And the line drawing expertise was just amazing. And now Jesus puts this question in the most stark terms. Do you see what he's doing? He's sort of taking this line drawing thing to its logical conclusion and saying, let's just face, which is lawful? Give life or take life? Do good or do evil? Which is it? And the line all of a sudden becomes very, very dramatic. Very stark. Because in a sense, that's always what the line is demarcating. It's just now we see it more or less on steroids. What is Jesus doing? He's putting the question in the sharpest possible contrast so that he can highlight something that becomes thematic in the New Testament. And that is that Christian people are not under law. The New Testament repeats this, especially Paul, more than once. We are not under law, we are under grace. And the questions asked by the mind of grace are very different from the questions asked by the mind of law. A mind inspired by grace is not asking how close to sin can I get and still be safe. The mind inspired by grace is saying how much good can I do here? Is there any limit to the degree of goodness that I can pursue here. I never had a young man ask me back in that Bible school, you know something, Mr. Gore, we're, we're in this relationship. We would just like your counsel. How can we be as pure and wholesome and healthy and, and uh, rich in our righteousness as a couple so we can build a good, solid foundation for our relationship that may last for a lifetime? We would just like counsel. And it was never that question. But that was the right question to ask. No, it's a question, how close to the pit of hell can we get without burning ourselves? You think, well, that's a different question. <laughs> Grace goes in a different direction than law. The Apostle Paul gives the Galatians counsel on this. He says, exercise your freedom in Christ, your liberty in Christ, but don't let your liberty become an excuse for license. You know, here's what, here's what the... The, the, the works of the flesh are, and he lists all these things, you know the list. Then he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is, and you can all give this list yourselves, can't you? Love, joy, peace, patience, and so on. What's the line at the end of that list? Does anybody recall? Well, that's right, that's the last of the fruit of the Spirit, and then the last, yes? Exactly. Do you hear that? There's no law against how loving you can be. Oh, I'm sorry, you're being too loving. There's no law against how joyful you can be. Oh, you're being much too joyful. Sorry. You know, I mean, sometimes we may try to impose those laws, but you know, in the kingdom of God, those are qualities for which there is no boundary. There is no line drawing here because that's what grace asks. And the New Testament wants to make that so clear to us. Paul over in Romans chapter 13 says, you know what the legal requirements are, you know, don't steal, don't kill, don't covet, don't do this. Do, don't. Then Paul says, bottom line, love your neighbor. 
if you love your neighbor, you'll do everything the law requires because the law is about minimum standards, you see, and grace is about maximum. So love your neighbor. Go out of your way to do good for your neighbor. And in by, by the by, in the process, you'll do everything the law could require of you. That's what Jesus brings to the... the so what, which is lawful here, friends? To do good or to do wickedness? And really, that's the question in every line-drawing exercise. You know. So Jesus replaces what's sometimes called in ethics the silver rule with the golden rule. You may have heard somebody say sometime, you know, lots of civilizations have had the golden rule. It's not true. Lots of civilizations have had the silver rule, as it's called. Confucius had a silver rule. Buddha had something like this. Others. The silver rule goes something like this. Don't do anything to someone else that you wouldn't want them to do to you. Right? It's a law of prohibition. As you're going through life, don't do something to someone that you wouldn't want them to do to you. It's a great rule. Yeah, nothing wrong with it. But Jesus is the first person in human history that we've ever found who flips that rule over and does what? He replaces law of restriction with grace. Whatever you would like someone to do to you, do that to them, right? That's grace. That's a very different way of thinking about life than simply a life of drawing lines and living in restrictions. And that's why Jesus now, in this remarkable moment, is really transforming Sabbath from a day of rest, a day of a kind of holy paralysis, as it had become in the culture of that day, into a day of holy action. Because it is, in fact, a day to do good. The Sabbath is a day to pull out the stops. This could be the most energetic day of the week, a day that we go out there and just look for opportunities to do good. Not, the, not you know, the six days or five days a week in the office, but a different class of activity. In fact, in the New Testament, the rule comes to be that if we see the good and don't do it, that has become evil for us. This, again, is incomprehensible to the legalistic frame of mind. James says it, therefore, to him who knows to do the good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Unfortunately, the history of the church has oftentimes been a history of entrenched procedures, traditions, customs, policies, bylaws that don't prevent us from doing the good. Well, we'd really like to do that, but you see, we have some uh, policies and procedures that don't allow that. You know. it's, it's a great excuse to be able to hide behind the shadow of certain rules we've put in place. Christian history has had its most glorious moments at the hands of people who broke the rules. I don't care about the policies. We are going to do this. And you've got a St. Francis of Assisi, or you've got a William Carey, or you've got a Martin Luther. You've got people who break the rules for the sake of some vastly more important principle. And these are the heroes of faith, and it becomes that question we need to search our own hearts. Jesus puts the other side of this, is it lawful to do good or to do evil? The first part of Jesus' question is calling attention to this man and the good that Jesus is just about to do for him. The second part of the question is calling attention to the religious leaders because, you see, even as they are sitting there, even as they are sitting there in the synagogue, they are plotting the murder of this good man. They are planning evil, wickedness, on the Sabbath, in the synagogue, in the presence of a man who is about to do the good. That's why he puts it that way. Which is lawful, what I'm doing or what you're doing? Is it lawful to do what I'm doing, doing good on the Sabbath, restoring health to this man, or what you're doing, plotting the destruction of someone who's doing good on the Sabbath? Which is it? Now that's cross-examination. And you can just feel the tension. And it's not hard to imagine why they uh, kept silent. <laughs> because he's putting the authorities on trial now. The answer was obvious to everybody sitting there. 
It was unavoidable, and there was no way they could respond except repentance, and they weren't prepared to do that. So when Jesus had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. By the way, notice he looked around. The story began with them looking at him, paratoreo, examining him with a meticulous kind of detail, hoping for some violation. The story ends with him looking at them, you see. He looked around. This is the word peri blepo, to look at them as a kind of a bank of judges there, you know. He's looking at them. But maybe even more striking, he's looking at them in anger. Bertrand Russell, another critic of Jesus, wrote an essay, some of you have read it, of course, it's called, Why I Am Not a Christian. And he tallies up a few of the points where he thinks Jesus really messed up and is not worthy of the allegiance that Christian people give to him. And one example he mentions is that Jesus got angry. Can you imagine that? I wonder if Bertrand Russell ever got angry. I don't know, you know, but uh, he holds Jesus accountable because Jesus gets angry. Well, Mark is not embarrassed by that. And in fact, as we go through the Gospel of Mark, we're going to find on uh, uh, sort of a surprising number of occasions that Jesus is said to get angry. It's implied even more times. The, The New Testament is not worried about the fact that Jesus got angry. We've sort of styled this course in Mark, Jesus, the man of action and compassion. But you understand that compassion and anger are pretty closely related. They both are deep emotions. And sometimes the very compassion you feel toward one person is at the same time the anger toward the person who's putting them in that position of need. And so Jesus now, this righteous indignation, comes to the surface. And he becomes a paradigm for the best kind of anger. It'd be an interesting little side lecture sometime to talk about how much good has been done in the history of the church by angry Christians. It was angry Christians who basically brought ghastly gladiatorial entertainments to a conclusion in the ancient Roman world. It was angry Christians who have labored to dismantle institutions like slavery again and again through human history. It's angry Christians who have been objecting to things like human trafficking these days. It's angry Christians who are objecting to uh, the liquidation of unborn human life. It's angry Christians who again and again are willing to step outside policies and procedures and challenge institutional wickedness. That angry Christian can be doing God's work inspired by Christ himself. Then I ask myself, what makes me angry? Someone cuts me off in traffic, you know. What makes me angry? Usually it's the tiny little slights. I can drive right past a hundred social ills, oblivious, but as soon as someone does some little thing to me, all of a sudden I'm angry. There's something wrong with that. I've appreciated so much John's series in the last several weeks on the Sermon on the Mount. It has a little bite to it. Does anyone notice that? If your enemy slaps you on the turn the other cheek. You see, there's an ethic that's supposed to kick into operation when I experience a personal slight, a personal insult. At that point, grace takes over and I love my enemy. At that point, there's no place for anger, there's only place for forgiveness and mercy. Because as I show mercy, as I pray for, as I do good for the person who's trying to do ill for me, Paul says I heap coals of fire on their head. I think fire of redemption there, I think it's fire of you know, the crushing sense of how they've been violating what they should have done. But the anger that has done good in history is not the anger of personal vindication, it's the anger that arises in the situation such as we find here. Why was Jesus angry? It was hardness of heart. 
Hardness of heart, one commentator said, has ignored slavery, has ignored child labor, has ignored concentration camps, has ignored a war on the family, and countless other offenses. Hardness of heart makes us blind to things that should make us angry. And the hardness of heart now is, of course, the blindness that has seized these characters. Interestingly, the healing took place as he stretched out his hand. Notice Jesus doesn't do anything here. Isn't that interesting? Jesus doesn't actually do any work. Sometimes he'll work to heal. He'll lay hands on a person. He'll make spittle out of mud or you know, whatever and plaster it on their eyes. You know, he'll do all kinds of things, sometimes rather strange things, to effect a healing. Here he doesn't do anything. He's just standing there. Well, stretch out your hand. Come on, man. Just do it. The man does all the work. You see, he just acts in obedience to Christ. He is liberated by Jesus on the Sabbath, has restored to him his capacity to labor, his right hand, presumably, restored to health. So the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. This is called conspiracy. Conspiracy in most civilized communities is a crime. If you get together after church today and have a little private conversation planning on how you can knock over a 7-Eleven across the street, you are committing a crime even if you don't knock over the 7-Eleven. Conspiracy is a crime. And these men go out and together with a political party called the Herodians, they engage in conspiracy to commit a crime on the Sabbath in, in precise fulfillment of what Jesus just asked them. What's lawful on the Sabbath? To give a man back his hand or to plot a crime? Which one is it? You know. So Jesus actually didn't commit any crime. The Pharisees were themselves divided over Jesus. Some were actually much more sympathetic to him than others, but those who were most hostile seemed to be the ones in view here. And they're willing to form strange bedfellows in order to do away with this guy. And in this case, the characters that are mentioned are the Herodians, who you know are mentioned in the New Testament occasionally. They're a somewhat mysterious group. There's actually been PhDs written, theses written on who were the Herodians. There's some 14 different theories as to who exactly were the Herodians. They are styled as everything from a religious sect that saw Herod as one of the messiahs to an extremist group opposed to Rome, something like the Zealots, to a party of tax collectors, and the list goes on. But the most likely is the one you've probably heard, that they were a political party, not a religious party, a political party, supporting the dynasty of Herod, his family, and Roman support of them, and hoping to restore a Herodian monarchy with Roman support in Israel. That seems most likely. <clears throat> that means that at this point, Mark wants us to understand that opposition to Jesus has now become not simply religious, but political. So early, chapter 3, already we see this. The least likely thing we'd say about the Herodians is that they would ally with the Pharisees. But of course, you know the old principle, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and so they can find common cause in their hostility, their desire to protect the status quo. The Herodians don't like Jesus because he is representing something that ultimately would be a threat to the things that they are trying to prop up, the dynasty of Herod and so on. The Pharisees don't like Jesus because he's a threat to the status quo as well. We always need to be careful as people in the church when we try to protect the status quo and form unlikely common cause with others in that interest. Just have to be careful. During the Inquisition, the church didn't want to get its hands dirty with torturing people, so they had the state step up and do it to protect the status quo, you see. It's a little risk we always have to watch out for. They go out, they conspire, as Jesus had implied, to do evil on the Sabbath. And with that, we conclude the five conflict stories that culminate in this criminal conspiracy to destroy a man for doing good. All right, well, my Sunday school lesson briefly 
refers us over to something the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verse 14. You all know this verse. Sin will not have dominion over you because you are not under law, but under grace. <clears throat> I hope this is our takeaway this morning. We are not under law, preoccupied with rules, lines, limits, excuses, all of these inevitably energize what is broadly called in the Bible lust. And it allows, as Paul says in Romans, sin to reign. The power of sin is the law, you see. It's law that sort of whips up within us those passions. Paul will say in Romans 7, the very next chapter, I wouldn't have known anything about coveting except the law said, don't covet. And all of a sudden, I was seized with coveting, you know. It's the restriction, it's the line that creates, in some ways, the, the energy of the passions within. St. Augustine, that famous incident when he stole some pears as a teenager, he lamented it, you know, at length later in his writings. Just a childish prank. We would dismiss it as nothing much. Hey, kids will be kids. Well, why are you so upset with yourself, Augustine? You lament at length, stealing some pears for Pete's sake. Get a grip. But you see, what Augustine saw in it was the depth of his own corruption. The only reason he wanted to steal those pears was because they were off limits. That's all. The pure pleasure of doing something just because it's wrong. It's that limit, that line drawing exercise that makes us become so fascinated with the forbidden fruit. The mind of grace goes a very different direction. It's not that grace excuses criminal behavior on our part, heaven forbid. You know. We are not permitted, as Jude says, to, to use grace as an excuse for license. But it just means the whole direction of our thinking is now not toward lines and the limits they represent, but the rule of doing good, which inevitably unleashes God's power to change lives and build his kingdom. We are Christian people. We are about doing good, not drawing lines, but doing good. And I think when we do that, we honor Christ. Thank you.